Good afternoon. My name is Elijah Fish, and I am a Kevin B. Harrington Student Ambassador. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for tonight's event. The Institute's mission is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life of their communities and strengthen democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse political issues or candidates. Now before we begin this afternoon's program, I would just like to remind you to turn off any cell phones or other devices that may make noise. Today's speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Shero, is an assistant professor of political science and history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her work has been in several scholarly journals, including Political Behavior and Public Opinion Quarterly. She holds a PhD in political science with a minor in feminist and critical sexuality studies and worked as an NCAA Division I women's rowing coach before attending graduate school. Today, Dr. Sherrill will be joining us for a discussion entitled Allow to Play But Not to Win, Gender, Sports, and the Policy History of Title IX. She will focus on the politics of public policy, the history of Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, gender politics, college athletics in the United States, and the politics of fatherhood. Following Dr. Sherrill's remarks, we will have a brief question and answer period. Please wait until the student ambassador with the microphone reaches you before beginning your question. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Elizabeth Sherrill. Thank you all. Thank you, Elijah, for that kind introduction. Thank you to my colleagues uh, in political science here for this invitation. I am delighted to be here with you all today and to share my work about Title IX. As the title of the talk suggests, I will be sharing my thoughts and uh, analysis today on a major piece of American public policy that was passed now 47 years ago in 1972, which is commonly known and referred to as Title IX. The law was designed to address concerns about sex discrimination in educational institutions and was literally passed as the ninth title in a large set of education amendments to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So Title IX is indeed a piece of civil rights legislation indebted to the conflicts and the language around race um, and the the policy prescriptions to address racial discrimination, and was actually only applied to athletics, the realm with which it has uh, consistently spurred political conflict in the ensuing years through a prolonged political battle uh, stretching across the decade of the 1970s. Since then, political contests over the law's meanings and mechanisms for policy implementation have emerged repeatedly. So I'm interested in understanding why this is the case and with what implication. In today's talk, I'm going to direct our attention to the law's central clause, which was designed to address discrimination in higher education, quote, on the basis of sex. Over the past four and a half decades, every other element of the text of the law has come under some form of legal or bureaucratic scrutiny. And what I mean by that is that courts have made rulings, the executive bureaucracy has issued interpretations on the meanings of participation, what counts as a, as a benefit received for, from an educational program or what counts as discrimination. Whether or not the athletic department actually constitutes an educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Yet arguably the most crucial clause on the basis of sex has received no such overt scrutiny. Title IX was a policy directed at multiple venues um, and with multiple outcomes. The most apparent and consistent have been in the realm of athletics. So for today's talk, I want to historicize why this has happened and the politics of public policy, focusing mainly here on uh, the application of this central clause to the domain of athletics and guided by the research question that has driven this project from the start. 
how have battles over public policy design and implementation altered political and social understandings of sex and gender? So inherent to this question is a distinction that it's worth uh, dwelling on for just a moment uh, between sex and gender that figures pretty centrally in my analysis of the debates and implications for public policy. One of the main arguments that I make in my work and that I'll draw out today is that Title IX has engaged biological understandings of sex in its policy design and implementation. And I'll provide us with a lot to think about in this realm today. So I'm thinking here alongside a long tradition of feminist thought, wherein sex is commonly the category used to think about and indeed to problematize how dominant institutions like medical science have defined biological characteristics of bodies as either male or female, whereas gender is the category of analysis through which we can come to understand how sex takes on some cultural and social meaning. And for my purposes, I'm interested in how it takes on political meanings. Now, scholars of feminist thought and queer studies have really thoroughly problematized the binary distinction of sex as merely a male-female categorization. Um, and you may also be familiar with the fact that sex itself is actually measured in multiple different ways, from chromosomes to physical traits of bodies to hormone le uh, levels within bodies, such that even medical doctors suggest that the notion that men and women are entirely separate and distinct um, entities is really a problematic idea. Yet, despite these widespread critiques, um, as I will argue today, these conversations have largely not penetrated the policy discussions around Title IX, which tend to take this binary understanding of sex as a key element of policy implementation. Of course, concepts of sex and gender are always also defined vis-a-vis -vis and at the intersections of race, of sexuality, of economic class, and physical ability. So today, as we think about how the central category of sex has been construed through public policy, I'll also draw our attention to what feminist scholars often refer to as the intersectional politics of public policy as well. Okay, so where am I headed? What I'm gonna to argue today is that within Title IX, there is an issue that is, in some sense, hidden in plain sight. We'll think today about how this policy, aimed to end discrimination on the basis of sex, came to naturalize sex as a characteristic of bodies. Title IX's policy design did so, importantly, in the realm of sports, but not in classrooms. And of course, it was designed over time to address concerns of discrimination in both domains. Classrooms, like most of those that you sit on, uh, on campus here, I'm sure, were by and large sex integrated, educating girls and boys in the same spaces regardless of their sex. Sports, in contrast, were sex segregated, first dividing girls and boys into different spaces by virtue of their sex. And this coexistent, historically rooted, yet ongoing mechanism of policy designs um, constitutes what I think of as the paradox of Title IX. This paradox makes current policy more challenging and indeed more fraught than our dominant narrative of Title IX's success in athletics typically acknowledges. And in today's talk, I'll develop um, what I mean by this. I'm going to draw upon historical uh, analysis of archival data, primarily from the 1970s, uh, but I can make some connections to where things stand today, in order to delineate what Title IX has to teach us about the relationships among gender, policy, and American politics. Now, my work indeed considers the politics of public policy and the relationships among institutions, policy actors, and policy debate. So in my larger book project from which this talk is derived, I ask these two interrelated questions. Uh, first, how do political battles over the meaning of law uh, shape policy design and implementation? And then, how does policy design and implementation shape social and political categories and identity? So I'm thinking here what scholars might refer to as a feedback or a recursive mo model of politics to explain something about the meanings uh, inhered within public policy. My plan for today is first to, to scope out, to put this in a slightly larger conversation than, um, than merely sports in Title IX. Um, and then I'll drill down into some of the specifics of policy so that you can get a sense of what's really going on within Title IX. 
I'm going to narrate a, a story that you probably have heard and that you think you know about Title IX that tells a broadly progressive story of Title IX's implementation in the context of the broader U.S. civil rights policy regime. And then I'll sketch out my basic critique of this conventional wisdom, suggesting that while elements of Title IX are certainly good, the paradox that's embedded in the law make for a more complicated history than scholars currently acknowledge. Empirically, then I'll turn to the 1970s to delineate how politics cemented this paradox into policy design. Um, and in doing so, I'll use this to discuss um, how it has produced the political uh, identity of the female athlete. Okay, so where does this fit within a broader conversation about public policy? Well, many scholars have done work about how policy creates categorical understandings of identity and often in unexpected ways. So the history of the US census uh, invariably takes us to the ways in which the census has created in different ways over time, the very meaning of race and racial categories. Not only did policies like social security bring economic stability to aged Americans, and their adult children, its naming of a certain age through which citizens might choose to retire indeed gave meaning to the life stage of being elderly and under certain conditions free from work. Thus, Social Security has both created a policy constituency of retired Americans and has fundamentally demarcated specific political meanings to the category of age. There are lots of examples of this type uh, across policy domains and historical moments. Indeed, a long line of research in, on the history of US social policy suggests that policy makes meaning of some of the most basic political categories and processes of citizenship, belonging, deservingness, and inclusion. So my work on these topics, right, thinks about Title IX. And in order to analyze this, I look to archival sources drawn from a series of archives of the US federal government. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about this in the Q&A if you're interested about the range of sources that uh, I've been working with for this project. Um, also about archives and archival research, which I think is a lot of fun, um, even though it's a, it's a deathly quiet exercise <laughs> in research. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that as well. It's really been a very fun project that's taken me to a host of presidential libraries, um, a stay at the National Collegiate Athletic Association headquarters, and some access to the private papers of the largest political interest groups active in sports advocacy in the US. So, right, I'm engaging these, these historical sources to do some particular work. Um, to analyze the policy history of a law that, uh, that also has and enjoys a dominant understanding of and within the American public imagination, right? So my thinking about Title IX was initially rooted in understanding the veracity of what I have come to think of as the progressive narrative of policy implementation of Title IX in the realm of sports. And as we think about this framing of policy, I think this is a story, right, that you will find very familiar if you know much about, about policy, right? This dominant narrative about Title IX is that it centers on the astounding growth in athletic opportunities, uh, particularly for women over the last 47 years, brought about by policy implementation, um, and often frames Title IX as the real crown jewel of American rights policy success, right? When we think about this in contrast to the implementation of civil rights policies addressed, addressing racial discrimination, right, we have much more complicated understandings of how well policy has worked. Opportunities for athletics um, for both women and men uh, have grown, but for women in particular, there are about 12 times as many college athletic opportunities for women as there were before Title IX was passed. Um, likewise, women's ability to gain access to graduate and professional schools have gone from being um, dramatically inequitable to now near parity. Even more strikingly, and in sharp contrast to other non-discrimination policies, um, like affirmative action, for example, the overwhelming majority of Americans express support for the application of Title IX to sports. This is a poll from uh, 2011, and in it, 78% it of Americans indicated that they believe that Title IX's impact has been very positive. There are lots of opinion polls that, um, that ask the question in a number of different ways. They come to similar conclusions. Um, that indeed, the most common understanding of Title IX, which many pundits um, and journalists and even a lot of scholarship on the topic really focus on, and this 
progressive narrative of Title IX's implementation of the, uh, in the realm of sports really dominates in our popular discourse, and it's used to mobilize a particular version of civil rights success. Of course, in recent years, we've also seen the debate of the application of Title IX to issues of assault on campus, um, and we can talk more about that in Q&A. Um, what I'm going to focus on today is the longer history of policy, um, which really requires us to think about sports, although I think in doing so, it provides us some insight to think about the, the debates that, um, that, are, that are most salient today as well. So Title IX, as I'm thinking about it here, is one of many elements of US civil rights policy. And its uh, history is therefore directly tied to debates over civil rights uh, and race discrimination. It was also born of a key moment from sex discrimination policy when second wave feminists were finding ways to institutionalize their critiques um, around non-discrimination policies addressing wage, pregnancy, disability, and workplace discrimination, right? Title IX was part of a, a broader moment for feminist politics. Yet our shared a narrative about Title IX is much more quick to exceptionalize its success rather than critically analyze its successes and its shortcomings um, of public policy, particularly when we draw it into contrast with, with these other policies. We as Americans are much more to think about its applications to classrooms and sports as more successful than other policies aimed at sex discrimination like pay equity, which continues to be a challenging, intractable, and indeed freshly salient, again, um, conversation in, in Congress right now. But when we place this dominant narrative uh, of Title IX in the civil rights policy case logic, it becomes much more clear that our thinking about Title IX is nevertheless freighted with problematic racial politics um, that I want to disentangle for us to think about today. So as much as I'm, I'm obviously entering into this um, from a critical perspective, um, and as complicated as I think the implications of rethinking what we think we know about Title IX may be, um, I think it's also helpful for me to share how I came to this project, um, because, uh, because that story is, is not largely a critical one. Uh, indeed, my athletic opportunities as an athlete were tied very directly to the law's implementation at my undergraduate institution. This is a, a, a screenshot from the front page of the student newspaper at the University of Minnesota when rowing was elevated from a club sport to a varsity sport during the spring of my freshman year of college. And I had been on the club rowing team that year and, uh, and therefore really had a front seat to policy implementation in the years that followed. Um, not only was, and you can see, right, they named Title IX as the reason for this decision. Um, this was, this was, uh, this was a directly a Title IX initiative to add women's rowing. Um, not only was I a policy beneficiary as an athlete, I then also benefited from a well-funded program as a coach, which I did for five years um, after, after finishing my collegiate competitive career. So, this is a photo uh, from my last season of coaching, um, and I post it to illustrate some of the mechanics through which Title IX actually works and has managed to expand athletic opportunity for women so dramatically. This is the team, the uh, University of Minnesota women's rowing team at the Big Ten Championships, which is at the end of the spring season. Um, and you'll notice there's a lot of athletes in the photo, but as many as you see, this is still only about half of the team that makes it to the championship season. The full roster is 85 women at the Division I level, and many schools choose to add women's rowing in part to balance out the even larger rosters on their men's football teams. One of the requirements of Title IX suggests that very large athletic programs can expand sports for men so long as they also expand equitable participation opportunities for women athletes as well. And so, Indeed, many colleges and universities have added women's rowing in particular as a countervailing force to the growth in men's football. And this was a huge benefit uh, and, a, and a part of my young adult life. Um, yet this positive and progressive story is not the only story of Title IX. One of the most basic complicating factors in the law's implementation is a distinction made by policy design that is commonly overlooked. So here we see the title of a position paper written by the ACLU suggesting that sex segregated schools would represent a turn to an outdated and outmoded practice of separate but equal. 
And indeed, the common attitude and de facto practice of most classrooms in the wake of Title IX has been predominantly pursued by integrating girls with boys, right, regardless of their sex. Yet in stark and, I argue, uneasy contrast sits the realm of sports. Women were not allowed access to men's athletic teams, but schools instead were encouraged to create separate teams for women. In almost every sporting context of college athletics, men and women to this day do not race in the same races, they do not row in the same boats, or play on the same competitive teams. And indeed, sex-segregated sports where women achieve athletic access by virtue of their sex are not merely the norm. They are encouraged and indeed codified by the specific mechanisms of policy design inherent to Title IX. So this divergent separate slash integrated policy design um, constitutes what I think is a paradox at work in policy implementation. And it makes the story of Title IX significantly more difficult. It sits in uncomfortable tension with the dominant policy story and indeed challenges the conventional wisdom that Title IX has been an overwhelming success. The reliance on sex segregation in sports in almost every high school and college varsity sporting context is indeed the most puzzling but under-analyzed element of the policy. Youth sports are commonly integrated with girls and boys playing together until about the age of eight, at which point in almost every context, sex segregated teams become the de facto practice. At the college level, many intramural and club sports, like ultimate frisbee, common example, um, are, that are beyond the purview of policy, that is to say Title IX pertains to intercollegiate varsity athletics, um, not, to the, not to the club and, uh, and, and intramural context. Um, these are much more commonly, even routinely integrated. But for schools sponsoring varsity athletic programs, Title IX has, since 1979, instructed schools to demonstrate compliance by counting the opportunities, the scholarships, and institutional support available to men and women in, ath in athletics as distinct and separate groups. And I argue that we really should not underestimate the consequences of this. Title IX elevates the custom of segregation in many adolescent sports to a codified, incentivized, and what other scholars call a coercive practice across American high schools and colleges. Sex integration, by contrast, has typically occurred in varsity level sports only on a case-by-case -case basis. And you may have thought of some examples um, that defy the rule, but in some ways also underscore the norm of segregation uh, because they seem exceptional, right? Um, and many times this integration has only come at the hand of legal threat from a single woman trying to seek access uh, to a men's team. What's more, in 1994, the US Congress defined the problem of sex equity uh, in sports primarily as a headcounting game. In this year, they passed the Equity in Athletics Disclosure Act, requiring schools to annually report their offerings of men's versus women's athletic opportunities. And thus, sex-segregated teams have made for a more tidy accounting of sex equity data for schools looking to demonstrate compliance with Title IX. And indeed, at the same time, this reifies the idea that men and women are different, that they require different teams in order to be treated equally. Now, sex-segregated sports are not the only sex-segregated institution, uh, particularly if we think historically, but they continue to be the most durable, right? You might think of the US military as a corollary example, um, and indeed the military is an institution with many corollaries to sport. Um, likewise, other historically masculinized occupations like firefighting and policing that have historically excluded women or segregated them in their training academies. Um, are, there's some other good corollaries here, but all of these institutions have evolved and indeed changed over time such that strict sex segregation is not only against the norm, uh, it's also in most cases against the law. So even the so-called combat exception um, that kept women out of military combat roles has recently fallen to legal challenges by the ACLU. Yet in sports, the opposite is true. Few exceptions of similar practice exist in the contemporary moment, perhaps only accepting, accepting the widespread practice of sex-segregated prisons and public restrooms though the durability of segregated restrooms um, is also contested in a lot of campuses around the country. Um, so that is a, an ongoing conversation. 
Um, and this raises the question, I think, about why sex segregation has been outmoded in areas like the military and in firefighting, but not in sports. And the answer that I develop in my work is that we need to return to policy itself here because the way that Title IX instructs schools to think about the category of sex um, is as an immutable characteristic of the body. And therefore, sports sediments bodies in particular ways that are made more durable through policy and practice. So I want to explain to, to you all more about the consequences of this and what I mean. And so with the remainder of my time, I'm going to draw our attention to the 1970s in order to delineate how we got here. How, how did this central paradox emerge? Well, in the 1970s, feminist activists were politicizing conditions of discrimination in higher education that had adversely affected American women, right? Until the 1970s, there was no such thing as a notion of sex discrimination. They were constructing the idea that, there were, that practices constituted discrimination when they were directed at women. Um, and that the consequences of this discrimination was diminishing women's ability to seek graduate degrees uh, and faculty positions, often through sex-based quotas that were actively excluding women. Congress first held hearings in, the 19, in 1970 um, on the topic of sex discrimination in education, uh, and these hearings were largely based on conversation around how to integrate women into classrooms, into faculty positions, into graduate programs, um, and in non-biased portrayals of women in educational textbooks uh, across the U.S. In fact, during the discussion of the 1972 amendments that would, uh, that would go on to include Title IX, feminist activists uh, were actually asked by allies in Congress not to actively lobby for the inclusion of a sex non-discrimination provision in the education amendments. Lawmakers thought that this would draw unnecessary attention and may even lead to its exclusion from the law. And so, by consequence, the law was passed uh, and signed into law in June of 1972 with very little debate. Sports were absolutely not foremost on the minds of policymakers, um, nor on the minds of feminist activists, for that matter, uh, when legislation was created. The original two congressional hearings in 1970 actually didn't include a single mention of the problem of sex discrimination in sports. The two times that sports were discussed in the congressional record, um, they came uh, through one of Title IX's legislative innovators, Senator Birch Bayh. And when Bayh spoke about sports, he implied a particular relationship between sports and sex, stating these regulations that would go on to become Title IX would allow enforcing agencies to permit differential treatment by sex only in very unusual cases where such treatment is absolutely necessary to the success of the program. He then goes on to say that in his thinking, such cases would include classes for pregnant girls or emotionally disturbed students in sports facilities or other instances where privacy must be preserved. By here is implying and assuring to fellow lawmakers that the prevailing logic embedded in the realm of athletics is of sex difference. Women are, he implies, different from men on a fundamental, even natural level. And this naturalization of difference is coaxed into light through his coupling of female bodies in sports with pregnant female bodies, suggesting the belief that women's bodies are not only different from men's, but they are capable of fundamentally different things. By posit sex as the marker for female bodies as those who require some special treatment, right? He's not actually talking about men in this context, and instead, men sit quietly as uh, the natural heirs to sporting spaces, um, and where it's implied that maybe women actually don't really belong. Although the federal bureaucracy then took up the task of taking policy discussions into policy implementation guidelines in the summer of 1972, the next major discussion of sports in the archive doesn't happen until a couple of years later. By the summer of 1974, policymakers had accepted this premise that men's bodies were more capable than women's of many physical pursuits. Segregation um, in the discussions that were happening in the mid-1970s were promoted as a means of protecting women's bodies from the presumably stronger male athletes. 
This, of course, at the same time as sex segregation protected men from the potential emergence of women athletes competent enough to challenge the sexist assumptions of their physical inferiority. And indeed, this notion of not just difference, but a gendered hierarchy that place men at the top um, where, and where women are inferior to men is really cemented in lots of different practices in sex segregated sports. In many contexts and in certain sports like ice hockey and lacrosse, the equipment, the rules, and the playing spaces operate with different rules for women than when men play the game. Physical contact between players in lacrosse and hockey are actually penalized in the women's game, even as they are the defining feature uh, encouraged when men play the same sport. There are other key examples of differential rules in basketball, especially when we think historically, as well as softball, commonly the parallel sport to baseball um, for, for women. Um, and indeed, some of these corollary examples have seen with time some evolution and the retiring of these sex-based rules um, as women's bodies have challenged their necessity over time. But in many places, the very same game played by different rules for women versus men is sort of fundamentally enabled by sex-segregated spheres. Now, in the 1970s, not all feminist groups uh, actually supported the notion of sex integration, or sex segregation, rather. So this is a, a key policy document um, that I turn to to make this point. In 1974, in this summer where they're again really starting to robustly discuss what to do with sports, the National Organization for Women declared a tepid support for a sex segregated design, advocating instead that regulations that promoted sex segregation should only be temporary. Feminist activists were, of course, in the mid-1970s, far from the diverse and institutionalized lobbying force then as they are now. And in 1974, the primary discussion on the liberal feminist agenda was this attempt to pass the Federal Equal Rights Amendment. Title IX and sports were only just emerging at this time as an important policy domain. But groups like now were concerned that segregation was going to set up a, a problematic uh, precedent. Yet, even as now sought integration in sports um, as a policy objective, feminists of all stripes face significantly entrenched interests um, from male athletes and coaches, organized in their lobbying efforts through the then men's only National Collegiate Athletic Association. The battles over interpretation of the law's meaning stretched on in increasingly public ways through 1975. During this period, thousands of citizens, coaches, physical educators, and interest groups wrote the government to weigh in on draft implementation guidelines for Title IX, forcing the government to actually extend the normal period of public comment in order to process the overwhelming response. Increasingly in this period, the discussion converged over the extent to which Title IX required equal spending on women's athletes. Men's football coaches, organized through the NCAA, never took seriously the idea that women might integrate men's teams, but they did fear turning over their resources. So in time, this battle, this battle over resources actually took center stage um, in guiding the political compromise that would produce Title IX's implementation guidelines. And indeed, the final compromise ensured that men's teams would neither be forced to open their teams to women athletes, nor to provide half of their resources to women's teams, right? The equal spending paradigm is not, uh, is not law under Title IX. The opportunity paradigm of access to playing opportunities and scholarships is really central, but not spending. Feminists consented to this approach, uh, requiring, as it did, the institutionalization of women's opportunities for competition, coaching, and training, right? And this had been the long-term problem, right, that women hadn't even had teams to compete on. So they thought at the time that this was an adequate way um, to begin the conversation. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that, that they were right, right? This compromise emerged instead of a robust discussion on the limits and potential of sex-segregated teams, which is interesting for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that when we think historically on some public opinion data here, there was actually some popular support for sex integration. 
This is a Gallup poll from 1974, which demonstrates that 58% of Americans were actually in favor of sex-integrated teams under a certain set of conditions. Even though sex segregation had been the practice for many years on sports teams before the 1970s, um, I think this provides some interesting insight that uh, a majority of Americans were actually prepared in this period to envision a different future. And context here, I think, in a number of ways is really imperative to understanding why this logic of sex segregation was such a reversal in the realm of education. Now, remember here, we're in the early 1970s, and this segregation integration question is looming large in the racial politics of education at the dawn of this decade. Schools were already the venue through which American racial politics were being renegotiated through logics of desegregation in the wake of the Brown versus Board of Education case, this famous Supreme Court case, which of course ended racial segregation. And in almost all educational institutions, including classrooms, graduate schools, um, and policies pertaining to the employment of university faculty, policymakers and activists accepted the basic premise of equality between men and women in this classic separate cannot be equal form, and thus created sex-blind implementation guidelines. When it came to classrooms, therefore, policymakers accepted Title IX's central premise that intellectually women were men's equal. And through Title IX, the baseless exclusionary practices of institutions of higher education were outlawed using these sex-blind implementation guidelines for the intellectual spaces of college campuses. Yet in the realm of athletics, the opposite sex-conscious solution was developed. The policy uses of Title IX and the political conflicts that have surrounded them have thus been rooted in a problematic tension between its ethos of intellectual equality and its ethos of physical equality. Indeed, the enforcement mechanisms developed for sports have, over time, entrenched this notion and practice of segregated equality, which rejects the premise of physical similarity between the sexes and supplants it instead with assumptions of natural, quote unquote, sex difference. This element of policy design thus assumes a male-female binary as the operative definition of sex, locating sex within the physical body, while constituting sex as a means for policy enforcement. Thus, and this is key, the US state implemented a widespread and over time increasingly entrenched practice of separate but equal only a few years after rejecting such ideology and practice for concerns over race and racial discrimination. By consequence, sex segregation came to naturalize distinctions of women's purportedly inferior physical prowess compared to men, and over time, Title IX's implementation in the realm of sports has renaturalized the very same sex-based distinction that men and women are somehow naturally different, that indeed Title IX was fundamentally intended to abolish. Over time, this segregation of bodies has become the routine and seemingly natural order and way to organize athletics. Many legal scholars and activists indeed continue to consider this a suitable solution to the problem, quote, so to speak, of physical difference. And indeed, my assessment of segregation as policy solution doesn't necessarily imply that I think it would have been better for sports to have been integrated right away in the 1970s in order for women to achieve fair treatment. Feminists in the 1970s had well-grounded concerns that abrupt integration after decades of exclusion from training opportunities could ultimately harm women. Instead, what I offer here is that um, when we both denaturalize segregation as the obvious solution and consider the effects of segregation on political understandings of sex and gender, it becomes clear that this segregation policy solution is not itself a tidy solution. Although the final guidelines that were eventually enacted in 1979 armed women with legal rights to claim space on athletic teams across the country, the consequence of their content is much more complicated. Although many women played on women's teams before Title IX, sports, again, were really not a central issue on the feminist agenda before the passage of Title IX. And indeed, it was therefore public policy that really codified and constituted this political identity of the female athlete under Title IX. 
But the defining feature of the female athlete under Title IX is not her athleticism, but is instead her presumed identity as female. She's politically cast as an athlete who happens to be female, uh, but rather as a female who happens to be, in some sense, athletic. Furthermore, when the government required special spaces for women in sports, it also centered the female athlete in a mobilizing identity of embodied rights claiming. And indeed, the best example of this is featured in this photo. Um, the woman in the front is uh, one of the members of the Yale women's rowing team who were given the chance to row under Title IX, but had to do so at an off-campus facility. They bus to the river along with the men's team, but after practice had to wait on the bus because they didn't have a locker room um, while the men were inside showering. They grew tired of shivering on the bus. Um, some of them were actually developing pneumonia. Many of these athletes went on to row in the, uh, the Olympic women's eight. These were very high level caliber athletes, um, but they were getting sick on the bus. Uh, and so they spent their time organizing this protest. They sketched the text Title IX across their backs and their chests May not, you may be able to see it if you're close enough to the front. She has written on her back in thick black marker, Title IX. Um, they alerted, this is key, a reporter from the New York Times, and they walked into a scheduled meeting with the Yale athletic director, having stripped from the waist up to reveal the text on their bodies, um, whereafter they read aloud a prepared statement. The story ran the next day in the New York Times. Um, and over time, thousands of women given access to sports by implementation of the law have mobilized to ensure its continued enforcement in subsequent moments. Yale built them a shower. Still, even as policy created the conditions under which the female athlete could mobilize in order to claim her rights, its implement implementation constructed a certain type of female athlete, marked by distinctive elements of privilege. First and foremost, of course, policy design created a complicated legacy for transgender, for intersex, and gender nonconforming athletes who continue to struggle to find inclusion in a sex-segregated system. What's more, even the Yale protests, I think, can teach us something about the racial politics that are still at work within Title IX. At political rallies, women commonly wear t-shirts car and carry signs declaring, as did the women at Yale, that I am Title IX. In contrast, rarely do we see political constituency groups of other civil rights policies embodying similar claims or wearing apparel in the workplace or on their college campuses, which claim, for example, I am affirmative action. Title IX has promoted certain types of embodied activism, but it has done so for already uh, dominant subgroups of already privileged women. The female athlete is able-bodied and capable of being admitted into colleges and universities in order to claim this right to sport. But she's also largely marked and racialized as a white woman who's middle to upper class. To this day, white women are overrepresented in college athletics when compared both to their proportion of college women and compared to their proportion in the general population of women. And indeed, policy uh, dictated that Title IX would replicate, but not ameliorate, the other race and class inequalities haunting institutions of American education. Yet, primarily and most insidiously, she was, of course, explicitly sexed by the effectuation of the very law that aimed to end the use of sex as a legal marker of access to education and sports. Still, the political category of sex as applied to bodies in sporting settings does not square well with the category of gender. Female athletes, through their myriad acts of aggressive play, unrelenting power and speed, unapologetic perspiration and competitive zeal, inherently flaunt, exceed, and collapse long-standing definitions of femininity. The ways in which purportedly female bodies commandingly embrace masculine traits of muscled strength inherently challenge the sex-based distinction upon which Title IX was built. Yet the price to pay for these shifting understandings of women's physicality is borne by the very bodies that Title IX claims to empower. The female athlete represents not merely a figure of progress, but also a figure imbued with deep tensions. Many sociologists have demonstrated that the gender policing of female athletes remains rampant in many subtle ways on sports teams across the country and in media portrayals of women in sports. 
women athletes must now continue to perform a certain brand of traditional femaleness, even as they compete in sports. Coaches from my former professional network jokingly refer to the ubiquitous long-haired high school and college athlete as something of a ponytail effect in, in uh, athletic competition. Indeed, short-haired athletes run the risk of confirming the lesbian stereotype. Thus, even the politics of hair length police how women are able to embody the category of athlete. Since the 1970s, women's ability to rearticulate the meanings of femininity through physical pursuits has been fraught with normative expectations attached to sex and operationalized through public policy. Failure to conform to feminine expectations often leads to the social denigration of such athletic performances as excessively masculine, inappropriately feminine, therefore possibly also lesbian, and therefore, perversely, the better and more competent the athlete, the greater the countervailing pressure to balance these physical feats by performing femaleness in gender normative ways. Indeed, the fear of heterosex as a result of integrated plane spaces, in part, also drove this reliance on sex segregation. And so in this very gendered sense, the female athlete um, was also constructed only through and implicated in discourses of heterosexuality, even as she remained haunted by the specter of same-sex attraction and lesbianism. Since Title IX presumes bodies to be biologically dimorphic, it constitutes the female athlete as a natural and therefore heterosexual counterpart to her male analog. As such, the looming lesbian in women's sports represents in sex-segregated spheres a threat to the legitimacy of the most basic tenet of Title IX. Bodies and identities, including trans folks, that, def that defy this categorization of binary sex suggest that perhaps the supposed naturalness of policy distinction is itself problematic and untenable. Yet, we rarely think of Title IX in this light. And I'll, I'll conclude on this last point here. Former President Obama frequently narrated the, this utopic version of gendered progress, suggesting here that there is no contradiction for female athletes between being strong and tough, beautiful and confident, a story that is itself freighted with unacknowledged racial and sexual politics. Title IX does not ultimately aid the escape from this contradiction for women in sports who cannot or will not embody whiteness, hetero or gender normativity. Thus, the path forward for women of color, for out lesbians, for closeted queers, for transgender, intersex, and gender queer people has been uneven and riddled with contradictions. Further, President Obama captures the real centrality of the forgetting of history that defines the contemporary politics of this policy. Title IX was never a policy that was designed to help recipient populations to bounce back from adversarial conditions. In fact, it was part of a sea change to codified civil rights through which the US Congress acknowledged that there were structural forms of discrimination that politically marginalized populations cannot bounce back from. And what's more, Obama in this quote reveals a deep irony, that in all other domains of civil rights policy, we have relentlessly sought to eradicate the practice of separate but equal, yet in sports, the first US president of color suggests that we celebrate them. Yet, because the sex-segregated organization of American sports is ubiquitous, it is also naturalized, such that President Obama is commonly, unproblematically celebrated as one of Title IX's greatest cheerleaders. So, by turning to history here, I think we can start to draw out some of these complications um, and to see Title IX as an example of how recursive processes of meaning making can solidify political categories with complicated effects. Although sports is not the only place, certainly, where we have negotiated the meanings of sex and gender, um, it has proved to be a very durable institution. So, in part because it locates sex in what many people commonly think of is the immutable or unchangeable physical body, we haven't seen the changes to sex segregation in sports that we've witnessed in other venues. 
And thus, as we approach the 47th anniversary of policy, my hope is that this analysis can help us to undo some of that natural work, can help us to see Title IX with new eyes, and to acknowledge that it has both helped and in some cases hindered women's progress. I often tell people that if there were elements of the talk that I gave today that made you unque uncomfortably question your own internalized beliefs about women's uh, limitations, about how sports ought to be organized, then that alone makes this a conversation that's worth having. And with that in mind, um, I suggest that even a few small changes to the way that we practice implementing federal policy, like ending some of the elements of policy which actually preclude women from trying out for the quote unquote men's team when a similar team is offered for women at their school are some relatively um, painless interventions to start to undo, to readdress, and to rethink the way that policy um, is operating now nearly half a century after it was passed. Furthermore, policies which extend the insidious creep of gendered hierarchies that attribute unilateral androcentric value to male athletes need to be reconsidered. Um, a number of state high school level associations continue to actually enforce rules that penalize girls who train and practice with the boys team. Some of them even precluding them from eligibility after they have gone on runs with say the boys cross country team to ever compete in the girls event. Such practices clearly limit the abilities of girls and women to achieve their competitive potential. And they also reinforce problematic gendered hierarchies that suggest that any opportunity that values increased speed or skill for young girls should be punished instead of valued. When it comes to math or to science, we've largely shed such sexist beliefs um, that boys are better at math than our girls, right? Even as we harbor and we nurture them in sports. So my hope here is that engaging in this work uh, might have intellectual as well as policy implications. Um, I look forward to talking with you more about this and to welcoming any questions. Thank you.